every Christian looks forward to Jesus' return. But what are the events that happen in the year after his return? This is probably the least understood aspect of Bible prophecy. <laughs> but also one of the most exciting. And in this video, we're going to show you the scriptures that detail those events step by step. The reason this aspect is poorly understood is that the timing of the return of Jesus itself is poorly understood. In our last episode, we demonstrated Jesus will return and set foot on the earth one full year prior to mounting a white horse and coming back to fight Armageddon, even though this is not taught in most churches. The reason it's poorly understood is the return of Jesus isn't a single event but rather a series of events. Taking months, not a single day, Jesus riding the white horse is the final event, not the first. When the wicked of this world are eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, living normal lives, as in the days of Noah, long before a single trumpet or bull judgment, then Jesus will return suddenly, coming on the clouds in great glory. This return is found in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, which corresponds to the events after the sixth seal of Revelation. On that day, he will resurrect the righteous from all the ages and rapture them and those that survived to that point living into his presence. So Jesus doesn't return at the event we normally associate with the second coming when he rides a white horse to Armageddon but he returns and sets foot upon the earth a year earlier. We proved that with multiple proofs in this previous video. If you haven't seen it, there is a link down in the description. That return will set off a series of events that eventually will culminate with Jesus riding the white horse. And this video will detail each one of them, the scriptures associated with them and the feasts of the Lord upon which each one falls. Yes, as we indicated previously in the earlier videos in the series, all seven of the Feasts of the Lord will be fulfilled in this final year. On that first day, Yom Torah or Rosh Hashanah, one year prior to the end, he will return on the clouds in great glory and resurrect and rapture the saints. It is the feast of the blowing of trumpets, especially the last trumpet. It is also the hidden day, the day that no man knows. So we can place our first event on the timeline. On that same day, he will descend to the earth and will pour out his wrath personally on the nation of Edom. We saw that in Isaiah 34 and 63 in that last video. And it is at that time he will stain his garments red by treading the winepress of the Lord Almighty. That is why his garments are dipped in blood when he rides that white horse later in Revelation. We discussed all this in that previous video. But what happens next? Now, if we're going to understand that better, let's circle back and look at the links to the Exodus account we discussed earlier in this video series. Prior to the Exodus, remember, God poured out 10 plagues as we discussed in those previous videos in this series. And as we also saw in those videos, these plagues have a one-for-one -one correspondence to the first six trumpet judgments. So God's second exodus will begin with the trumpet plagues. And that is exactly how Revelation continues the account. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. So if the trumpets begin at the start of the final year of the 70th week, how long do they continue? That's a great question. Now we know from Revelation 9, 5, that the fifth trumpet lasts five months all on its own. Five months is a very interesting length of time. That same time period is mentioned earlier in the Bible. In Genesis 8, 4, that is the length of time the floodwaters increased upon the earth during Noah's flood. It was an identical five month period. We have surmised in previous videos that the first wrath of God 
found in the Genesis flood will be similar to the second wrath of God in Revelation, especially in terms of timing. So, is this an approximate time for the trumpets? Five months or maybe a little longer? We think it is. If the first five trumpets take five months, let's place that on our proposed timeline. But what about the sixth trumpet, the trumpet of death? When a third of the Earth's population is killed by fire and brimstone, when might it occur? Well, six months after Yom Terora, and the start of the trumpets is Passover. What exactly happened on Passover? On that night, the blood of the Lamb protected the children of Israel from the destroyer and the death of the firstborn. What might happen in a future final fulfillment of Passover? Might it be the fire and brimstone of the sixth trumpet that Jesus defends Israel from that night? Well, possibly. That seems to make the most sense to us. Israel was protected on Passover from the plague of death, and the sixth trumpet is the trumpet judgment of death, when a third of the earth's population is killed by fire and brimstone. So before we move on, let's summarize what we've seen so far. Jesus descends from heaven, and every eye sees him. Then he rescues believers in the resurrection and rapture into heaven, and their rest begins, but he himself stays upon the earth and stains his robes. On that same 24-hour day, his angels begin to sound the trumpet judgments, and it seems like this takes about five months or a little longer to complete. During this time, the first five trumpets devastate a third of the earth. That is primarily, in our opinion, the beast empire. After the first trumpets are blown, in Revelation 10, we see something absolutely incredible, a strong angel or messenger descending. Now, many believe this might be Jesus because of his appearance. Everything about his appearance matches Jesus. His clothing is a cloud. Jesus is the great cloud rider. He has a rainbow over his head just as a rainbow is above God's throne in Revelation 4. His face is like the sun. And in Revelation 1.16, Jesus' face is like the sun and his legs are like polished bronze, just like as in Revelation 1.15. And of course, this messenger roars like a lion. The only reason to believe it might not be Jesus is this word angel. But if we translated the Greek angelos as a messenger, not an angel, well, then there would be no problem. Now, this is a very mysterious part of Revelation, and I don't mean to say that this channel has it completely figured out. But let's consider that this might be Jesus descending to the earth from heaven. If so, this might be the same event as Isaiah 19.1 where Jesus rides the clouds and comes to Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Is this also the point where Jesus frees the Israelite captives in Egypt in a replay of the second Exodus as we discussed in this previous video in the series? To which you are probably thinking, well, wait a minute. That passage says Jesus rides the clouds to Egypt. Doesn't he just ride the clouds once? How many times do you have him riding the clouds and coming and going from heaven? Now, in order to understand this scenario, Jesus would have to descend to the earth at the second coming, after the sixth seal, stain his garments and eat them, and then ascend again only to return once more prior to the second exodus. Ascend one more time in the future only to return on his white horse. So that implies multiple ascending and descendings, almost like Jacob's ladder. No one I know has ever suggested this before. You need to keep that in mind. However, the Bible does not preclude it. Christians have only assumed Jesus rides the clouds once. But hold on. We can prove 
that it is more than once. Let us show you something I bet you never noticed before in the book of Daniel. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Did you ever notice the direction of Jesus' travel is up, not down? He came on the clouds up to the Father, not from the Father down to the earth. Now we'll explain what event this is and what feast of the Lord this happens on shortly, but look at the verse again. Behold on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days, Daniel 7:13. Notice Jesus came up to the Father. To have come up to the Father, he had to have been on the earth. And then there's that incredible verse, Isaiah 19:1, that says Jesus rides the clouds to Egypt. I would think most people watching this video for the first time would think that Jesus rode the clouds to the Mount of Olives and split it. But you know what? This verse says he also rides the clouds to Egypt. So maybe it's because he rides the clouds more than one time. So after Jesus' return, after the sixth seal, we believe he ascends and descends from heaven at least three times, contrary to the rest of eschatological thought. You need to keep that in mind that we are the only ones teaching this, but scripture seems to support it. In John 1, Jesus told a flabbergasted Nathaniel, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Notice ascending and descending. Now we realize everything you are seeing in this video is brand new theory and you may have to watch the video several times. That's okay. We consider this a very, very important video. If we are correct about the length of time the first five trumpets last is a little longer than five months, this would place us almost exactly at the right place on our timeline of the final year in order to fulfill a second exodus on Passover. As we discussed in those previous videos, Travis Snow, author of The Passover King, expects the second exodus to take place around the Passover, six months prior to the end of the 70th week, and so do we. The next feast to be fulfilled is the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread, of which Passover is only a single day. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. You shall tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Leaven, of course, is a symbol for sin. Jesus' sinless body was broken for us. It was symbolized by unleavened bread. And the sign of the Lord on a person's forehead makes them acceptable for the Lord, as we saw in the previous video. But what happens to fulfill this feast in the end times? Notice, it was the time to celebrate the coming out of Egypt. So this is when Jesus fulfills the second exodus and brings the Israelites out of bondage and begins his journey to the promised land. At least that is our opinion. Does a mixed multitude leave Egypt just as they did in the first exodus? Both Israelites and Gentiles who have been converted, maybe so. Isaiah 19 certainly states that Egyptian Gentiles will be saved at that point. The third feast of the Lord is the Feast of First Fruits, the day when Jesus was raised from the dead. If we continue in Revelation, the next chapter, after chapter 10, is chapter 11 about the two witnesses. Is the Feast of First Fruits fulfilled when the two witnesses are raised back to life in the city of Jerusalem? We don't know. 
but it sure fits with this ongoing narrative. One might argue that's impossible because the two witnesses have to be raised to life after 1260 days. That would be true if the 1260 days concludes the end of Daniel's 70th week, but maybe it's a different 1260 days. Maybe their raising to life is simply a 1260 day period starting earlier than we have anticipated. We don't know for sure. Their rising to life comes next in the Bible narrative and it fits with first fruits. But we aren't dogmatic about this. It's just an assumption on our part. After the Feast of First Fruits, the people of Israel begin the Feast of Weeks as they count the Omer until Pentecost, the 50th day after First Fruits. What was Israel doing in the 50 days after their escape from Egypt? They were heading across the Sinai toward Mount Sinai. In the end times, what would Israel be doing after Jesus freed the captives in Egypt? They would be heading to Mount Sinai just as they did in the first Exodus. Perhaps Psalm 68 depicts this multitude. O oh God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens also dropped rain in the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked in the presence of God, the God of Israel, kings of armies flee. Psalm 68, 7 through 8 and 12. So it seems that during this time, as Jesus leads them to Mount Sinai, kings are fleeing before the throng of Israelites with Jesus in the lead. The Israelites then arrive at Mount Sinai and at Pentecost in the Exodus account, God came down on the mountain in fire. On Pentecost, in the New Testament, tongues of fire and the Holy Spirit were poured out on believers. If the Holy Spirit descended upon Christians at Pentecost in the first century, isn't it likely that he does it again for Israel in the end times? Isn't it likely that this is the moment when all Israel is saved? So let's add Pentecost to our timeline. At least that is our opinion on how all Israel will be saved. And it's also the opinion of Travis Snow, who we mentioned earlier, that Pentecost will be the day that all Israel is saved and then they'll continue on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus then leads the procession from Sinai to Jerusalem, freeing the captives along the way as he goes. And what Habakkuk tells us about this is absolutely amazing. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hands and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. Habakkuk 3, 3 through 5. Rays coming out of his hands? It looks like Marvel Comics got their Iron Man ideas about rays shooting from someone's hand <laughs> from Habakkuk's picture of Jesus. Next, the procession reaches Jerusalem and enters the Golden Gate. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my Yeshua, or salvation. Psalm 24 pictures this as well. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Psalm 24, 7 through 8. In 1541, the Muslim Caliph, Suleiman the Magnificent, who knew about these prophecies, sealed this gate to prevent the Jewish Messiah from entering it. However, the gate he sealed is a more modern gate that was built in the Middle Ages. In April, 
1969, American archaeologist James Fleming came to study the Golden Gate but fell into a hole and supposedly found a gate beneath the Golden Gate. If this is the true gate of mercy below Suleiman's, it gives new meaning to Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O gates. Will the gate of mercy be lifted up for the Messiah and the Israelites to pass through? That is our thought. After Jesus enters Jerusalem, he is ready to be crowned king. And the next feast on the calendar is Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, the traditional day for coronating God as king. And of course, that is the meaning of the seventh trumpet. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. This event, the crowning of Jesus as king, happens in heaven, as we have already seen in Daniel 7, behold with the clouds of heaven. One like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. As we indicated before, this is a moment where Jesus again ascends into heaven. Why? Why go back up? Because only the Father, God the Father, is worthy to crown Jesus king. Certainly no earthly man is worthy to do that. Psalm 47 alludes to this day. When we look at it as referring to the coronation of Jesus as king on Yom Teruah, it is incredible. God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Notice God has ascended just as we surmise to the sound of trumpets and a shout on the feast of trumpets and shouting or Yom Teruah. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Of incredible interest to me is that the psalmist envisions God subduing nations under him and under our feet. Is the psalmist one of the raptured saints witnessing the coronation of Jesus in heaven? Huh? I think so. So let's add Yom Teruah again to our timeline, a year after the first edition, this time for the seventh trumpet and the coronation of Jesus. Notice he mentions that God was subduing nations under his feet while Jesus is still in heaven. So how is he doing that? By pouring out the bold judgments on them during the days of awe, the 10 days between the feast of Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. The shallow bowls described in the bold judgments are meant to be poured out quickly and in rapid succession. So it makes sense that this would take place over these very few days. The bowls are also incredibly severe, so the world wouldn't last long if it took place over a longer period. After the sixth bowl, we read Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophets' reaction to Jesus' absence from Jerusalem. Don't think they didn't notice that Jesus wasn't in Jerusalem anymore. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 13 through 14. At this point, ever since Jesus' coming a year ago on Yom Teruah, 
The Antichrist's political power has been dramatically reduced. That is why he needs demonic deceptive power to gather the kings of the earth. He can't just order them to assemble and try to retake Jerusalem. But King Jesus then gathers his angel armies and the great multitude of raptured saints in heaven on Yom Kippur for his glorious final return to the earth to defeat the forces of evil. This is finally the moment Jesus mounts that white horse that we've been talking about for the last two videos. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except he himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. That's what we talked about that happens in Isaiah 63. And his name is called the word of God and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Revelation 19, 11 through 14. The battle does not take long. Jesus captures the Antichrist and false prophet and throws them into the lake of fire. And Satan is chained in the abyss. Now we have one more feast to go, Tabernacles, but before we get to it, we want to acknowledge that this video is somewhat speculative. However, I want you to notice how the order of the feasts matches perfectly with the order of events in the Bible and also with the logical timeline of how long each might take. So it's speculation, but it's logical speculation, biblically based speculation. Now on to Tabernacles. After these things, a great feast is held, the Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all peoples, even the veil, which is stretched over all the nations, a feast where God and his people commune together. We have one last mystery though. This feast takes place after the completion of the 70th week of Daniel. It happens in the millennial kingdom, in the Jubilee year. If you remember, we alluded to that in this video that introduced the feasts. So the Feast of Tabernacles happens in the next year since it occurs after Yom Kippur, which is the end of the year before the Jubilee. It takes place in the millennial kingdom and that seems entirely fitting. Now that we've outlined what's going to happen in that final year, how soon is it going to happen? Could some of the warnings of Jesus' return be happening right now? Well, click right here to keep watching what comes next after the coronavirus and the rioting in the streets that the world is experiencing in 2020. I think you'll be surprised. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.